Welcome to Trial Site News Weekly Roundup. My name is Adrian, and I'll be going over some of our top news stories from this past week. Please click the subscribe button and ring the bell to be notified of future videos. This week we start our roundup with HIV and AIDS related news. The southeastern United States is one of the few regions that still faces a growing rate of new HIV cases. Minority communities in some cases are still ravaged by this disease, and nearly 50% of all HIV cases are now in minority communities in southern states. Miami's HIV infection rates is nearly four times the U.S. average, and as such, Miami has become the face of AIDS in America. Consequently, the National Institute of Health has granted the University of Miami $14 million to study HIV in aging populations. The southern United States faces ongoing challenges, with Miami as the epicenter of HIV and AIDS, with a multitude of challenges from social and economic to social detriments of health. The research effort seeks to improve the situation on the ground, especially with afflicted minority groups. Jones Weiss pointed out that health disparity is a key issue facing the city in its fight against HIV. A lack of sufficient health care and preventative access persists in the city, including access to pre-exposure prophylaxis, or PrEP, medication. Next, Merck announced a Phase 1 study evaluating the pharmacokinetics and safety of a prototype subdermal drug eluding implant for extending administration of Islafetrir, the company's investigational nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor, or the NRTTI, in healthy volunteers. The prototype's early findings were presented as a late-breaking oral presentation, abstract TUACO-401LB, at the 10th International AIDS Society Conference on HIV Science, or the IAS, 2019, in Mexico City. This study will evaluate the safety, tolerability, and pharmacokinetics, or PK, of two doses of oral MK8591 compared with placebo in adults at low risk of HIV-1 infection. Merck seeks to recruit 250 participants. The study planned end date is April 2021. And now we turn to cancer-related news. City of Hope, a renowned cancer research site, reports that it is the first institution in the United States to open an immunotherapy clinical trial for liver cancer that, if successful, eventually represents a transformative treatment of the often fatal disease into an outpatient procedure working with sponsor Eureka Therapeutics. Patients with advanced hepatocellular carcinoma, the most predominant type of liver cancer, have a very poor prognosis and limited treatment options. The rate of, li of liver cancer diagnosis has more than tripled since 1980, according to the American Cancer Society. About 42,030 new cases are expected, and about 31,780 people are expected to die from the disease in 2019 alone, reports City of Hope in a press release picked up by Eureka Alert. Yuman Fong, MD, director of the Center for Surgical Innovation at City of Hope, co-investigator of the ongoing clinical trial, and the San Giacomo family chair in surgical oncology noted that the, no the novel T-cell platform has the potential to transform T-cell therapy into an outpatient procedure. He continued, We Eureka Therapeutics and others are designing T-cell therapies with low toxicity. Principal investigator Danang Li and the reports that the traditional immunotherapy such as checkpoint inhibitors release the brakes on the immune system, which allows it to sometimes attack the tumor but can also lead to attacks on other parts of the human body. Dr. Li mentioned that this approach engineers immune cells to directly attack a protein that is expressed on liver cancer. We are trying to individualize treatment of patients with advanced liver cancer. ED140202 T cell therapy was first tested in China in a first in human proof of concept study. The ongoing study has demonstrated a favorable safety profile with no cytokine release syndrome, or serious side effects that includes overexpression of certain proteins, or drug related neurotoxicity, or side effects. The engineered ET140202 T cells recognize and bind to the AFP peptide HLAA2 complex, becomes activated and kills the liver tumor cells. 
Meanwhile, in further cancer-related news, Bayer announced that the U.S. FDA has approved Nubica, or darolutamide, for the treatment of patients with non-metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. Nubiqua was approved under the FDA Priority Review designation, and approval was granted three months ahead of target FDA action date. The U.S. FDA granted fast-track designation for darolutamide in men with NMCRPC. An MAA application is under review by the European Medicines Agency and the Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare, or the MHLW, in Japan. Darolutamide is being developed jointly by Bayer and Orion Corporation, a globally operating Finnish pharmaceutical company. Next up, the Imperial College of London and the Institute of Cancer Research UK has launched a new £13 million convergence science centre, bringing together researchers from different scientific disciplines to develop a range of innovative cancer techniques. Cancer experts Paul Workman from ICR and Lord Era Darcy from Imperial College of London leads this dynamic, innovative centre integrating knowledge and methods, not to mention the expertise from a range of important disciplines from physics to data science and artificial intelligence to engineering and biology biological sciences and medicine. The Convergence Center will concentrate on the following themes. Early Detection Therapy Monitoring, Convergence Therapeutics and Data Science with Paul Workman as the Director. Now together with the Royal Marston Hospital, the ICR forms the largest comprehensive center, can center in Europe according to a report in The Independent and was ranked first among all British higher education institutions in the Times Higher Education 2014 Research Excellence Framework Table of Excellence. ICR has been ranked at the highest levels, world leading according to all rankings. The ICR receives its external grant funding from the government body, the Higher Education Funding Council for England, from government research council bodies, and from charities including the Wellcome Trust, Cancer Research UK, Breast Cancer Now, and Bloodwise. It also receives voluntary income from legacies and from public and corporate donations. Next, OFEB was a promising drug for mesothelioma a form of lung cancer. Unfortunately, the research for a cure hit another barrier as recently this promising immunotherapy drug combined with a chemotherapy failed to slow disease progression in a phase 3 study. As published in Lancet Repository Medicine, the study results revealed no advantage. Median progression-free survival was 6.8 months for patients assigned OFEB as compared with 7 months for those with the placebo. The drug, however, has been approved for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis in October 2014 by the Food and Drug Administration and received a positive opinion from the European Medicines Agency on November 2014, being approved there in January 2015. It is also approved in Canada, Japan, Switzerland and other countries. Nintinab was approved for combination of non-small cell lung cancer in the EU in 2014. Next up, we turn to autoimmune-related news. A new study led by researchers at the University Hospital Marques de Valdecia in Spain published in the Journal of European Academy of Dermatology and Venerology reports that hydrodenitis suprativa patients are at greater risk for having NAFLD, a case-controlled study, the principal patients, were recruited from a Spanish hospital. A total of 86 patients with HS and matched control were examined for body height and weight, body mass, index, abdominal circumference measurements at baseline. The results show a high prevalence of NAFLD in HS patients, independent of classic metabolic risk factors. Therefore, we suggest HS patients to be evaluated for NAFLD and managed accordingly. The lead researcher was M.A. Gonzalez Lopez, University Hospital Marquez de Valdecia. Next, we turn to SiteWatch news stories. It is alleged by Indian authorities that a Nestle-sponsored trial has blatantly violated Indian law as a local contract research organization known as a CRO. Local research sites and investigators conducted clinical trials on 75 premature babies in five hospitals on substitutes for breast milk in complete contravention of the Infant Milk Substitute Act. The study was titled, Multicentric Obser Observational Study to Observe Growth in Preterm Hospitalized Infants. If this legal violation is true, there must be accountability, not only with the sponsor, but importantly with the clinical research site, and even regulators that may have looked the other way within IC ICMR. Dr. Manjoni Mitra of MedClin Research Unit represents the coordinator and research director of this trial. The five participating hospitals, all privately held, which undoubtedly have culpability, should these allegations be true, include Cloud9 Hospital, 
Institute of Child Health, Manipal Hospital, Sir Ganga Ram Hospital, and Calcutta Medical Research Institute. And they had quotes on their websites like the best pregnancy maternity care in India, one of the first pediatric institutes in India, best hospital in Bengaluru, committed to world-class research, good health starts with great care. Now, India's clinical trials past is haunted with legal and ethical violations. Then, perhaps, the Indian Supreme Court went too far in overregulating in reaction to some traumatic situations, including deaths. The Indian Supreme Court rules that clinical trials can be approved in India in only three situations. One, if it is related to an unmet medical need of the country. Two, in case of innovations versus existing therapy. And three, on basis of the risk-benefit analysis. But, as reported in the story, the Indian norm increasingly becomes unregulated clinical trials. A report by PricewaterhouseCoopers on emerging markets in India touts the fertile grounds for clinical trials. Apparently, Nestle's study didn't fit into any of these categories. Now, let me take a moment to talk about what we do at Trial Site News. We have a site watch and investigator watch. Markets become more intelligent by the day, with internet, smartphones, and social media. The world becomes a much smaller place. For example, the individuals listed in this story are being put on the Trial Site News site watch and investigator watch database. That's right. We have a database that not only factors in previous incidents, warnings, letters, and the like in real time, we are always adding to that list. It is unfortunate that the world's biggest actors conspire to add to this list. After all, there are a lot of really fantastic sponsors and sites and investigators. They believe in not only what they are doing, but in the legal, ethical, and moral frameworks that govern clinical research. And this is kind of our point. Quality, safety, and productivity are a culture, a mindset, and a way of being and seeing the world, not merely a checklist to cover one's proverbial butt. The longer term, well-intentioned and ethical producers will generate more value to society. It may not always translate to immediate cash, but for a clinical research program led to build greater, more enduring, longer-term outlooks based on localization of ethics, morals, and principles, and adheres to rule of law, the returns are enduring. And now we shift gears to clinical challenges. The FDA seeks to apply risk-based profiles to enable institutional review boards, or IRBs, to waive or alter what can be stringent requirements for obtaining informed consent for certain clinical trials involving minimal risks to participants. The proposed changes represent a material deviation from the current IRB informed consent requirements and could bolster clinical trial efficiency for IRBs and clinical investigators participating in what could be classified as minimally risk clinical trial. Now, under the FDA's proposed rules, IRBs are granted flexibility and ultimately power to determine waiver decisions. Under the proposed rule, the IRBs, in order to waive informed consent, must find that the research involves no more than a minimal risk to the subjects, the waiver or alternation will not adversely affect the rights and welfare of the subjects, the research could not practically be carried out without the waivers or alterations, and, whenever appropriate, the subjects will be provided with additional patient information after participation. In a powerful example of executive branch agency rulemaking, quasi-legislation, with what could be profound implications depending on the circumstances, the drug development landscape could be significantly transformed. We here at Trialside News are all for flexibility. Clearly, the intentions are good, and the authority is there for this kind of incremental but significant modification to informed consent rules. The fact is that the biopharmaceutical industry is stuck in many risk-adverse and antiquated processes based on the CYA model dealing with the rules, regulations, and stiff penalties they face if there are violations of these rules and law. Locally, where we think we have evolved past most unethical behavior, we still must be vigilant. There are areas we must monitor carefully. For example, many IRBs are now not nonprofit or part of academic centers, but for-profit vehicles funded by large private equity groups seeking double-digit returns over a period of time. In fact, there has been a wave of private equity-led IRB investment that had led to considerable consolidation. Now, there is nothing wrong with this. The pursuit of growth, profits, and value accumulation is a fundamental part of our underlining Western democratic and economic system. We even know some principles that stand to gain tremendously from such wealth generation, and more power to them. It's just that, when herd mentality finds a loophole and runs with it, the ethics can be lost for the bigger prize of profits. 
The financial crisis of, of 07 and 09 is a great example where loopholes helped all involved, from attorneys to credit agencies to accountants to the banks themselves. Find the excuse to pump toxic debt worldwide, and it wasn't an individual thing, it was a systemic thing. Now back to the primary point. Flexibility, agility, and creativity are a great thing for IRBs, but also ensure they and all else are monitored and that the rationale for the new exceptions for informed consent waivers are not used for self-interest versus the public good. Next up, Patrick Girondi grew up in the rough, tumble streets of Chicago. He made a small fortune in the commodity trading pits. It was the American dream. And then he had his son Rocco, who was born with a brutal blood disease called thalassemia. Thereafter, Patrick moved into biotech to launch a drug to save his son's life. This company became known as Errant Gene Therapeutics. Patrick learned that the hard, rough and tumble streets of the South Side paled in comparison to the Ivy League battles that lay ahead. Chicago-based Errant Gene Therapeutics has sued Third Rock Ventures and Bluebird Bio CEO Nick Leslie, alleging that the pair conspired to kill a competing medical treatment. Filed in Suffolk County in Superior Court in Massachusetts, plaintiff Arendt claims that Arendt Jen purchased exclusive rights to a gene therapy drug being developed by Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer, or MSKC, Center researcher Michael Sadalin, MD, PhD, in 2005. Both the biotech ventures are developing a rare blood disease treatment. Bluebird recently secured European approval for its drugs, reports Becker Hospital Review. Third Rock, the defendant, sought to license the vector, which was a key component of the drug being developed by Dr. Sadalene. Dr. Sadalene refused to abide by the 2010 terms. Aaron Jean signed the vector's rights back to MSKC in 2010, or 2011. But the plaintiff claims that the Third Rock's relationship with MSKC CEO Craig Thompson went to benefit Bluebird as Third Rock thereafter negotiated the rights for Bluebird. The lawsuit essentially alleges that Investor Third Rock is a proactive agent in not only going through actions to benefit its, its portfolio company Bluebird, but the group conspired to damage Errant Gene's therapeutics. It should also be noted that Errant Gene also sued MSKC for stalling their clinical trial. Now, Trial Site News initiated a project to review publicly available information, including court records, to derive a more thorough understanding of the case at hand. To read the in-depth article, please see the link below in the description. Turning to clinical trial-related news, Google's corporate stated mission has always been to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. And the Silicon Valley company delivers the goods. A medical college of a Wisconsin-led study studied Google Translate and found that the translation technology can effectively and accurately translate non-English randomized clinical trials for systemic review. The researchers' results were published in the Annals of Internal Medicine. The overall agreement percentage was 91% out of 6,370. The overall agreement percentage was 91% or 5,791 variables out of 6,370. Agreement percentages varied by language, but all hovered between 85 to 97% in the good category. Now, what about quality and risk of bias ratings? Google Translate fared well. Quality ratings equaled 96%, while the risk of bias scored 87%. There was a disagreement in ratings which resulted from a difference in translation. Other disagreements were based on differences in interpretation of items in the quality standards. The team sought to utilize Google Translate to understand the accuracy as a tool for systemic and accurate translation of non-English randomized clinical trials. Jeffrey L. Jackson, MD, MPH, with Medical College of Wisconsin reported that we include that the Google Translate is a viable, accurate tool for translating non-English language trials for the purposes of conducting systemic reviews. Next up, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, or CHOMP, reports a breakthrough in developing adeno-associated viral, or AAV, vectors as a groundbreaking clinical tool for gene therapy and gene editing. Announcing a novel, more sensitive method for capturing the footprint of AAV vectors, they also reported in a press release a broad range of sites where the vectors transfer genetic material. CHOP articulates that by capturing the full range of gene expression, patterns caused by AAV vectors, the technique could advance the rapidly developing gene therapy field. CHOP's most recent study results were published in Nature Communications. The lead researcher is Beverly Davidson. AAV vectors are bioengineered tools that utilize harmless viruses to transport modified genetic material safely into tissues and cells impacted by otherwise difficult to treat conditions. 
The vectors deliver the genetic cargo into tissues, after which the modified genes will create new instructions for those tissues and help treat the disease. CHOP has been a true gene therapy hub. By using the vector technologies developed at CHOP, they are responsible for the first FDA-approved gene therapies, including Chimera for B-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia and Luxturna for inherited retinal disease. The study funders were National Institutes of Health Grant and T32 Institutional Training Grants. Meanwhile, Massive Bio Inc., a leader in precision medicine and artificial intelligence, or AI, enabled business patient centric clinical trial matching, announced its newly developed hub aimed to build strategic partnerships with some of the most prominent just in time or JIT vendors and provider clinical research teams looking to facilitate the largest JIT oncology clinical trial network in the world. Massive Bio joins forces with select vendors to accelerate oncology enrollment solutions and optimize workflow efficiencies for global biopharmaceutical sponsors. We found that they are implementing a disruptive model in the pursuit of bringing world-class clinical research to patients and, conversely, patients to clinical research. Our interview article links is in the description below. Elsewhere, a London-based clinical development services company confirmed launch of a phase one clinical trial for AGSV+, an experimental vaccine designed to protect against many different mosquito-borne diseases, including the Zika virus. The clinical trial will test AGSV plus vaccine safety and immunogenicity when given with or without adjuvant to small groups of healthy volunteers. With 50 participants, the phase one study will randomly assign five groups for about 12 months. During this time, they will attend several study visits, which may include physical examinations, blood connection, skin bi biopsies, and a mosquito feeding procedure. The sponsors for this trial are NIH, University of Maryland School of Medicine, UK Department of Health and Social Care, and the lead research investigators are Matthew B. Lawrence. Shifting gears now to pain management. Regenstrief Institute, which is closely associated with Indiana University and the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, will co-lead a $21 million national study to find the best approach to manage chronic low back pain. The VA is directly funding the 20-site trial. Lead clinical investigators are Matthew J. Blair, MD, MS. Low back pain is the most disabling chronic condition around the globe. The National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke reports that 80% of adults experience low back pain at some point during their life. A challenging condition, often those afflicted end up in pain clinics receiving steroid injections and opioids for pain management. Many an opioid ad addict started out with back pain, and the opioid epidemic has ravaged America. Low back pain is the beginning of an incredibly vicious downward spiral for millions of people. But especially in America, where opioids were and are used to help manage this insidious problem. In other countries, it is more difficult to obtain opioids. This next story involves food allergies. The National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, or the NIAID, part of the NIH, has partnered with Genentech, Roche, and Novartis to conduct a new study to evaluate an experimental treatment for food allergies. More than 4.8 million children in the United States suffer from food allergies. Not one approved preventative treatment exists. Although experimental desensitization strategies are present in research settings, people with food allergies must avoid known allergens and are advised to carry injectable epinephrine to prevent potentially life-threatening allergic reactions caused by accidental exposures. The NIAD supported Consortium of Food Allergy Research, or COFAR, will conduct outmatch at 10 clinical sites throughout the United States. The study aims to enroll 225 patients ages 2 to less than 56 with an allergy to peanuts and at least two other foods, such as cow's milk, egg whites, wheat, cashews, hazelnuts, or walnuts. Roe Federal Systems Division, Inc. will serve as the, st as the statistical and clinical coordinating center. Do you have any clinical news you'd like us to report on? If so, let us know. Contact information is in the box below. If you'd like to watch more videos, click on these playlists here. Thank you for joining us for this week's Trial Site News Roundup. And remember, subscribe and ring the bell to be notified of updates. And we'll see you next time.